Welcome to Glass Half Full with Leslie Krongold. She shares her stories, experiences, and knowledge of living and coping with a chronic health condition. Learn about tools and resources and hear inspirational interviews that help you to live a life filled with quality and dignity. With two decades of support group leadership, Leslie's ready to help you make lemonade out of life's lemons. Are you ready? Welcome to the Glass Half Full Podcast. If this is your first time listening, I hope you'll check out some of the episodes from the past three and a half years. This is our 75th episode. If something you hear resonates for you, then it's quite possible that many of the previous episodes have something to offer you as well. I've wanted to tackle this topic of prayer for a while. In fact, we certainly have talked about the power of faith and prayer in other episodes. A couple of years ago, I spoke with the autism pastor, Dr. Lamar Hardwick in Georgia, and in one of our caregiver-themed episodes, we spoke about faith. But we've never focused specifically on the power of prayer. I chose now because Thursday, September 12th, next week, is designated as the Unity World Day of Prayer. This happens every year, but I was able to plan ahead this time. So on September 12th, For 24 hours, there are activities you can engage in, either virtually on the internet or perhaps in your local community. You'll have to check out the links I've included on the Glass Half Full website to learn more. So for this episode, I spoke with three people about prayer. I'm often curious about the differences between prayer and meditation. Two of my guests address this. The first guest is Molly Lannan Kenny, who is a yoga therapist, teacher, writer. You'll learn more about Molly in a later interview. I was reading her book to prepare for my interview with her about bedside yoga, something she's been doing for nearly 20 years. And I realized during the interview that she'd be the perfect person to reflect on the similarities between prayer and meditation. The second person I interviewed is an old friend from college, New York University, Rabbi Robin Leonard Nafshi. I can't recall what Robin was studying in college, but she went to law school soon after her undergraduate time. And for years, Robin worked for Nolo Press, writing self-help legal books here in San Francisco. She was active in a local synagogue and was a big help to me when I made my documentary film on women rabbis. But at that time, she wasn't a rabbi. And I don't even know if it was something she was considering. The last guest I have is a man I met recently at a podcast conference I attended in Orlando, Florida. We were at a speed networking event for podcasters. It was insane and very loud in the hotel ballroom. But Jay Holland stood out. He didn't introduce himself at the time as a pastor, But he made great eye contact and shared with me how his son had battled cancer. So I'd like you to sit back and relax. And I promise you a very thoughtful and heartfelt show. It's a little longer than many of the previous podcast episodes, but it's worth it. Before you meet Molly, let me tell you, that I did meet her in person several years ago. I attended the Northwest Yoga Conference in Seattle, and she taught one of the extended sessions. I I can't tell you the name of the session, but I remember really liking her. 
So I bought her book. Skip ahead four or so years, and I notice a post she wrote in an accessible yoga Facebook group I'm in. This is in the last couple of months I saw this. She was promoting a bedside yoga program that she was teaching, and that piqued my interest, and I got in touch with her. So this fall, you'll learn more about her work. In our conversation, she told me how she had just graduated from the Living School for Action and Contemplation, which explores the heritage of faith from the Christian mystical tradition. And I know this sounds unusual, but it will make sense once you hear the interview. But Molly's sister had recently passed away before she attended this um, program, Living School for Action and Contemplation. If we're coming from the yoga side, we understand those as completely different. And I would also say a a lot of where my work is moving into, especially after having finished this two-year program with Father Richard Rohr, is I think a lot of times in the yoga world, we are like, we've sort of run away from and kind of eschewed anything that smacks of Abrahamic religiosity or mm-hmm. like the Judeo-Christian religions that most of us grew up in. So we're kind of, we kind of steer clear of those. So I think from that side, when we, when we think about meditation, we think of meditation and prayer as being something totally different. And in many ways, prayer is something that we wouldn't do or we wouldn't facilitate from the yoga side. I actually don't think that's true or correct. Um, and I think that also in different traditions. So, for example, in Christian mysticism, what they might call prayer in many ways, like centering prayer, for example, is uh, one of the primary practices of Christian mysticism. Centering prayer is essentially meditation, open meditation, right? But they just use different, we, they use a different term for it. So I think it really, I think it's a lot about defining what those terms mean. I think also a lot of us who grew up with prayer, we still tend to think of petitionary prayer, like, you know, please God, like make my mom get better, let this tumor go away, or, you know, whatever it might be, those kinds of prayer. Whereas mystic prayer is more, um, I would say it ends up being more on the listening side of really sort of listening to the still small, listening for the still small voice of God. Um, or when I was just when I was just at my, I just graduated my program last week. And so I was up in Albuquerque with my cohort. And one of the people in my group was saying, I hate when, you know, when I want people to pray for me, I I hate asking them because I feel like, why should you be praying for me? You know, there's so many other people who need to be prayed for and all of this kind of thing. And, and I shared with him that I had had an episode on my way to Albuquerque um, where I'd been reading texts from my sister that were still on my phone and they actually it wasn't a positive idea to do at the time and it sort of sent me into a panic attack I guess would be the closest that I could come to and I just um, was changing flights and I was kind of losing it in the airport in the Dallas airport to, to the extent that actually it's a little embarrassing a little vulnerable to say but some of the people from the personnel from personnel from the airport came out and they were like are you okay you know do you need anything and In that moment, I texted two of my siblings, my husband and my best childhood friend. And I said, you can't do anything for me, but can you just let me know that you're there? Mm. And my friends who were in at the living school with me had been talking about how he didn't like when, you know, to ask people to pray for him. They said, well, that's, that's really what prayer is that like, you've just defined prayer. Prayer is really the act of reaching out whether to a uh, quote unquote real person, a material person or to a divine presence and saying, can you bear witness to my suffering so that I don't hold it alone? And I think that that is an extremely powerful and useful tool for, for all of us to whether, you know, whatever way we want to define it or whatever religious orientation we might connect with or, or push away. Um, the idea of being able to just open ourselves up and ask that we are witnessed in our suffering is, is a prayer modality that is extremely healing and useful. 
I've already told you that I met Robin years ago when we were in college. She now lives in Concord, New Hampshire, and is in her 10th year as the rabbi for Temple Beth Jacob, a congregation of 200 families. So, what is prayer in Judaism? How, how do Jews pray? When? What is the importance? And, and what are the variety of ways that prayer is part of one's life? So in, in traditional Judaism, uh, a Jew prays three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, and pr- prayers are essentially made up of three kinds. There are prayers that praise God or bless God, there are prayers that thank God, and then there are prayers that make requests of God. And for most of our prayers outside the Sabbath, all three kinds are a part of the prayer service. On the Sabbath, however, prayers of request are generally removed from the prayer service. The idea that the Sabbath is a day of rest, and if uh, God rested on the seventh day, we humans rest on the seventh day, we continue to allow God to rest, and so we don't ask for prayers. We don't ask for things. We don't make requests of God. The only exceptions, and these are interesting, are prayers for peace and prayers for healing. Mm -hmm. We can ask those questions and ask for those things even on the Sabbath. So three types of prayers, three times of day that we pray, um, but that's the formula and the formality of prayer. I think prayer for Jews is as individual as each Jew is. Prayer can be a way to speak directly to the divine. Prayer can be a way to speak directly to oneself, uh, and particularly if one thinks that God is within Prayer can even be an expression of aspiration, what, what I'm hoping for, right? When we pray for peace, or may the one who makes peace in the high heavens bring peace to us, we don't know that there's peace in the high heavens, we're, we're hoping there is, but it is what we aspire to on earth and for our own lives and for our family and community. So we have lots of prayers for peace, and again, it's not that we do it because we think each time we say it, it's going um, it, it, to, it, it's either we're, we're frustrated because it feels empty because it's not being, there's no response because there's so much war and hatred in the world. But again, it's something to which we aspire, or it may be something to which we seek ourselves. Uh, we also note that the word for peace, shalom, shares its root with the word for healing and wholeness, which is shleimut. Um, and so really healing means to be at peace. I, I, I will often, somebody tells me that their loved one is perhaps you know, in hospice or dying, and I'll ask them if they want to be on our healing prayer list, to which the person will say to me, they're not going to get better. Uh, you don't need to put them on the list. And I said, a healing prayer is not, is not about curing. Healing and curing are two different things. Uh, one can be healed by dying at peace with the illness one's had or the cancer or um, being able to leave one's loved ones behind or whatever it is, that is, that is a peaceful, you know, a way of healing and bringing about peace. Um, but that's not curing. Those are two very different things. And we don't pray for curing. When, when, when someone is sick, we pray for a refua, shlema. Refuah is healing, and shlema is like a complete and whole healing. So it's complete, com, you know, completeness and wholeness and health, and all wrapped up in that sense of peace. So the idea of praying for peace with, you know, where the person is at, not necessarily some sort of miraculous cure. There's like that rational mind knowing that that perhaps can't happen. We're not looking for magic. Exactly. Exactly. We're looking for acceptance. We're looking for, you know, it's, it's sort of what I think, I don't remember who wrote about it, but it, somebody wrote about the good death, mm-hmm. right? Where, you know, where you have this sense of, I'm not in a place of regret. I'm not, I, I don't have um, unfinished business. I'm not leaving relationships ugly, you know, all of those kinds of things where you, where you come to, a, where you're completely at peace with, 
with the diagnosis and you're ex- you have an acceptance of it and you know you you're able to move forward in a place where there's really a sense of peace and wholeness to you um but but you know th- th- that isn't to say that when somebody has a kind of you know a chronic condition um which isn't necessarily a death sentence that is the, you know those kinds of prayers for peace are for remission their prayers for a particular course of treatment to work successfully, even if we know that the person will come in and out of uh, flare-ups to their illness, um, we still pray for, you know, a re- you know, sort of receding of the of the uh, of the condition. You know, so yes, we can we can ask for things that seem not miraculous, but I think most people pray, quite frankly, for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not they're seeking a connection to the divine, prayer helps a person feel centered. Prayer can help a person feel of that sense of peace. Many people, and I think this is really interesting with the yoga practitioner, is that you know, peace and uh, prayer and meditation often, for some, are one and the same. And they wake up in the morning and they have a practice that involves prayer and it involves breathing and it involves maybe yoga positions. So, you know, it's all along a continuum, um, particularly for those who are not traditional Jews, or Orthodox Jews who, wake, who will wake up and say a set of, recite a set of prayers that have been predetermined. Um, and many of them, you know, that is a deep spiritual connection, and they feel that connection to God by doing this, and they feel that sense of wholeness and completion. For others, it feels like an empty recitation, mm-hmm. and they're you know, they, they do it because that's what they're supposed to do, but they don't always find meaning. And I've had many a conversation with Orthodox Jewish friends who say sometimes, like, they admire the liberal denominations where you can focus on a particular prayer or a particular chant or something that brings you meaning um, in that moment without feeling like you have to go through a whole litany of things just to get through them because somebody said you were supposed to do that. What about community prayer as a community versus prayer alone or someone coming to you and you praying with them? How are, you know, what's, what are the differences I think, there? So I think for, for most people, they are overwhelmed in a positive way when they think about the fact that a community is praying for them. So people will very specifically say to me, can you include my name on the the healing list, the prayer list? I have three people on there. In fact, one had a stroke around the time she turned in her early 70s. She just had her 80th birthday. She is probably, yeah, she is probably about as far along as she is going to get in her rehab. She has to live in a nursing home probably for the rest of her life. But truly knowing that people were praying for her every time we came together as a community and that we still do gives her so much uh, joy Mm -hmm. and hope and possibility um, that, you know, she's taken up piano, she's taken up a little bit of painting, you know, she really has found reasons to live. And, And it helps her so much knowing that her community is praying for her. Every week, every week, every time we, we join together in a prayer service. So it's, it's fascinating and, and fabulous to me. And I, and I have some other congregants similar. I have one who has chronic liver disease, and she is on registries and lists waiting for a liver transplant. She goes for um, treatment three or four times a week. Um, and she is, you know, she too loves coming to synagogue when she's able to, but she's usually not. She's usually able to. She's usually so exhausted, but it gives her strength feeling and knowing that her community is praying for her. And even people in a communal setting where they may say a loved one's name silently, so it's not even said out loud, or they say their own name silently, there's this sense for many people that all of these voices together rise up to some place, you know, the source, the divine, call it God, whatever, and from there goes out into the universe and brings healing to all those in the universe who are in need of healing. 
So many, many, many people nowadays come to synagogue to say a healing prayer, whereas a generation or two ago they would come on the anniversary of the death of a loved one. Now it's more to say a healing prayer for their loved one. I was reading something yesterday because uh, I'm trying to do a little research, you know, like actual scientific studies um, <laughs> about the power of prayer. And it was introduced to the term, and I don't have it in front of me, so I may be mispronouncing it, intercessory prayer? Something? Yeah, yes, you've got it. Uh, intercessory prayer. It's, it's, that is where you're praying for people when they don't know you're praying for them. And the, the, the attempt is to figure out if it makes a difference in a person's life. Are they going to be cured or healed or whatever measurement the uh, whoever is doing the study uses when people who you don't know are praying for you pray for you. It's very controversial as to whether or not uh, there is a success rate to it. You know, someone will point out, oh, well, this study showed, you know, more people with cancer were healed or went into remission than in another study. The overwhelming majority of studies show no difference at all. And I think that's partly because for people to get a sense of healing or feel uh, an improvement and therefore then report an improvement, they need to know they're being prayed for. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you add that element to it, then most definitely the rate of reported healing or feeling better or even possible cure or remission tends to go up because I think people do really benefit from knowing people are praying for them. Mm -hmm. It's when you do it without their knowledge is the very controversial part of it of whether or not it's really has any efficacy. I'm glad you're familiar with that. So you oh, very. I, when I was in rabbinical school, I did an independent study with a theology professor on, and it was entitled, you know, why pray for, for healing. And so it was all about, it was partially about intercessory prayer, but it was also about communal prayer and individual prayer and why we pray, you know, why go into a hospital room and stand by the side of a bed and ask a person if you can pray for them or if you can join them in prayer and pray together. Why do that? Why do it in a communal setting? All of that. And I was trying to, I was exploring in that paper of whether I could come up with a theological reason for it. And I ultimately decided that no, I could not, because it was so incredibly individual, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, someone was seeking God and someone was seeking community and someone was seeking not to be alone. I mean, they just wanted to know that somebody cared about them and loved them and held them in their hearts and were willing to pray for them. And it was just a way to counter loneliness, mm. which um, I think anybody who has had any kind of a chronic condition, a debilitating condition, knows exactly what the loneliness of illness is. So it just happens that I have a history with you, but you're certainly the right person to talk to about all this. <laughs> How great. How fortuitous. Yeah. yeah, this has been a great interest of mine for a very long time. Uh, before I moved up to New Hampshire, I was both a part-time rabbi in a synagogue, and I was also a rabbi chaplain for a Jewish healing center across three counties in New Jersey. Oh. So I've done a lot of this. I've, I've worked as a hospice chaplain. I, I've done a lot of it. I've thought a lot about it. I've researched it. It's so, I mean, prayer in general is so individual. And I think praying for healing does even more so. And I think it's more so because each one of us reacts to illness so differently. So many of us are private people. We don't, I'm, I remember a member of my congregation a number of years ago had breast cancer. She did not want anyone in the congregation to know. She did not want to be on the healing list, right? So I actually keep on the healing list, like initials at wow. the bottom, where you wouldn't, where nobody would know who they are. They, you know, like say RC. Maybe huh. there's probably, you know, a bunch of people in the community named Art with the initials RC, and it doesn't even have to be from the congregation. It can be somebody I know of, and you know, in, in, in my family or in you know somebody else who's just said, you know, please pray for my uncle Richard who doesn't want to be announced publicly anywhere of a plea. So I'll have those initials down there, and I, and I will do that with people, because even though they don't want the community to know, and they're very private people, they still benefited from knowing that someone was praying for them. 
that someone held them in their heart and, you know, asked, literally asked God uh, for healing each, mm-hmm. you know. So it's very, very, very powerful, but so individual, and it's so hard to generalize, therefore. You know, you, and, and we want to allow people to have their prayer life reflect who they are, um, and especially in a time of illness when everything else in, in your life is generally not in your control. Mm-hmm. If you're sitting in a hospital bed, everybody else controls, you know, who comes in, when, when they poke you, when they take your temperature, when they do everything, when they feed you, what you eat, everything. So if there's something about it that you can control, uh, it's very powerful. So being being prayed for, by whom, when, and what capacity is often just the smallest thing to give a person control over. Well, for how, how about just, um, I don't know what the best term would be, I want to say disbeliever, that, that sounds so negative, but someone who is, identifies as atheist or agnostic, and there's certainly, you know, cultural Jews or Jews who no longer identify as Jews, but are still Jewish, um, have, have you had any experience where, you know, they're in a time of grieving, whether for themselves or some other suffering, and they can't pray, but perhaps they are more open to you know, meditation or other forms of energy that are less... Uh... Oh, oh, definitely, definitely. And that's where I also, as I know somebody, I try to either characterize prayer or where the prayer is directed in a way that might resonate with them. So as, as one person once said to me who had a absolute no belief in God, and this was just a general conversation about prayer, he said to me, you know, when I come to synagogue and I say the words of the prayers, it's not because I believe them to be literal. He said, I just think it adds to the source of energy in the universe that then goes out and touches each one of us. He said, I don't think there's any kind of divine who's directing it or taking it all in and sending it back out, but I do believe in sort of universal energy that our prayers can be added to that energy. And so, you know, when I say the words of a prayer, I don't take the any of the God language literally. Another person said to me in our house, we just add an extra O, and instead of God, we think in terms of goodness. Mm-hmm. And so when we pray, we're praying for the good and the well-being of each person. We're praying for goodness in our world. Um, and he said, and that's how we practice our Judaism. You know, very active member of the synagogue. Um, it's it's not that it keeps anybody from being connected, but they've made peace with where they have where they are theologically when they have no no belief in God or no sense of God. But it doesn't mean they're not going to not going to participate in prayer because they they recognize, and I try to teach that that prayer that prayer is metaphor. And I'm not going to tell you what the metaphor is. I want you to find it, right? Because, again, for each person, the metaphor is going to be different. Mm -hmm. That's why I try to say to people, recognize that prayer is often aspirational. It's not a reflection of the way we see the world to be in actuality. I know you had your own health scare, uh, I'm not sure how many years ago, but how did that impact you as a spiritual being? How did it, you know, change your relationship to others who uh, go through, you know, a health scare? So, um, in 2011, I was diagnosed with endometrial cancer, so that was one thing. But I actually do have two chronic conditions as well, so I live with health conditions and scares or, you know, going in and out of things all the time. It has been a a challenge to me at times. It it really has. I mean, I have to take my own advice sometimes and and think of the metaphor, not think literally. I remember one time a colleague of mine who was working on his doctorate in in philosophy and theological philosophy, and he asked the question of, uh, to a whole bunch of people, he asked the question of, what are you most afraid of? And 
the you know people had you know the, the climate you know collapsing from you know, climate change and nuclear war and you know all these sort of large you know catastrophes that could happen and i said to him you know i'm a rabbi and i have something called Sjogren syndrome that weakens my joints it's in the family with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus i said you know what my biggest fear is my biggest fear is that one day i will open the ark and not be able to pick up the torah scroll mm. that my health will be at some place where i can no longer do what i love to do or what helps me with my sense of identity in the world this is core to who i am and what i do and so prayer for me it's not the miraculous stuff. It's really that shlemut, that that I will have the wisdom to know what path to follow, that my doctors will have it, um, that I will keep myself as strong and as possible, that I can continue to do these kinds of things. I mean, I've already accepted the fact that the role of what we call hagba, which is the person that lifts the Torah scroll at the end of a Torah reading, I can't do that. I can't lift it mm-hmm. that high above so that the congregation can see it and turn around with it. I've already given that up. But just to pick it up out of the ark, that's what I want to continue to be able to do because my illness mostly affects my hands. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I feel most of my joint pain. Um, I also have fibromyalgia, so I suffer from muscular pain a lot as well. I mean, I just sort of have systemic pain throughout my body. And so it is, for me, it is... Uh, um, you know, a, a relationship with God, who I do believe in, who is a source of strength for me, uh, but really not so much that I expect God to, quote-unquote, do the work, but that I do, that my loved ones are there for me, that my medical providers continue to be wise and caring, and things like that. Now, I was going to say that's the same thing I was seeking in prayer when I had cancer as well. Mm-hmm. You're open with your community, I assume, because you're talking about it on a podcast. Yes, I'm very, I'm, I'm very open with my community. What Sjogren's is, is how it really differs from the other um, connective tissue autoimmune conditions is that it is dryness coupled with the muscle pain and the, uh, the joint pain. And so I have severe dry mouth and dry eye. And so every Yom Kippur, I stand before the congregation, and before the service begins, I actually take a sip of water, and I explain that I have an autoimmune condition in which I have severe dry mouth. I have to drink, or else I will not be able to function. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about the obligation to fast, but it is incumbent upon a person, if for medical reasons, that they must eat or drink, that... Uh, it'll be a greater sin for them to fast than to eat or drink. Um, and then I recite a meditation prayer written by Rabbi Simcha Weintraub that is called a meditation for one who cannot do a traditional fast. And I offer it to anyone in the congregation who has to eat or drink over Yom Kippur. Jay Holland, the man I met at a podcast conference, is the senior pastor at Covenant Fellowship Baptist Church in Stewart, Florida. He has a podcast called Let's Parent on Purpose. I spoke with Jay shortly before the Hurricane Dorian approached the Bahamas. So let's say you meet someone in one of these, you know, events that has nothing to do with your church or your community. And they mm-hmm. find out you're a pastor and, they, and they've and never been affiliated with any sort of religious group. And they ask you, what is prayer? How would you explain that? I would say uh, on just the most basic level, prayer is talking to God. It's the way that, that we interact with God, um, which is a pretty incredible privilege if you think about it. I mean, I... It would take me a few weeks to get an appointment with the mayor of my little town here in Stewart. It would take me some real connections to meet the governor of Florida, and and I don't even know how I could meet the president of the United States, but the creator of the universe um, uh, allows us to to come before him anytime we want. That's a a humbling and awesome thing. Um, So prayer is 
prayer is talking to God. And are there different ways to pray, you know, such as alone, as a community, silently reading scripture? How about those different pathways? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you, you know, when you ask are there different ways to pray, you think about your relationship with, with anybody else. Are there different conversations that you'll have with them? You know, I've been married for 12 years, and and I love having really engaging conversations with my wife, but sometimes I just like being by her side. You know, so we, sometimes our time off is just happily being next to one another, enjoying the presence of each other, even if we don't have a lot to say. So, um, you know, I think prayer a really healthy way sometimes is, you know, if you don't know what to pray, uh, realizing that the book of Psalms in the Bible, it's it's a song book. It was ancient Israel's song book to God, and, and most of them are prayers to God. And what's really interesting as you start to get into them is there was a lot of complaining. Um, and, and, I, and I actually appreciate that, that God found it worthwhile in, in his scriptures to uh, show us so many examples of prayer where people's lives were very messed up, where they could not see the other side, um, where they weren't just giving God a bunch of false platitudes, but they were saying, God, how long is this going to last? I feel surrounded. You know, there's one of them that Psalm 88 that even ends with, you know, and darkness is my only friend. Um, so there's some real depths of despair sometimes in prayer, but I think I think some of those are the, the greatest acts of faith that you can have, because um, to to go to God and say, I don't know what's going on, I don't trust, you know, I, I don't even know how to trust right now, but I trust enough to still come to you, is, is a pretty extreme act of faith. So can you speak to the power of prayer as an action, a practice for people who are going through some sort of chronic uh, challenge, be it emotional, physical, uh, spiritual. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I can I can give you uh, just three examples, and 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 you feel free to use what's helpful to you. Uh, the first is I, I this I'm actually in my second marriage. My first marriage, I married my high school sweetheart um, after five years of dating. Right after we graduated from college, and had a good, happy marriage, and you know had its bumps just like every young marriage does. Um, but but we really loved each other and we're doing really well. And uh, then she came down with um, an autoimmune disease uh, called ulcerative colitis, and uh, this girl who was full of faith and full of love, you know, spent days after days of misery and complete agony. And every time we would try a treatment, she would um, have an allergic reaction to it or something would go wrong. And I mean, the the number of different weeks we spent in the hospital and, and, and between that, just the number of weeks that she spent at home, unable to go out, unable to travel, um, you know, there's some real depression that, that hit in there. And I remember um, one of the things that, that Christy would do is she would write out prayers and she would tape them all around the house. So, you know, I would go into the bathroom and there would be prayers and Bible verses taped up in there. I would walk down the hallway like anywhere, anywhere that you'd been. It was like a breadcrumb of, of prayers of just calling out in hope. And a lot of it was like, Lord, I don't understand what's happening Um I don't know what you're doing through this, but but I, I still need you. And um, there's some incredible comfort in that of, of just realizing, you know, you don't have all of the answers, but you can go to the person who does. Um, now, she ended up uh, actually dying of the complications of that sickness. And so that would be my, my second one is, um, you know, leading up to her death uh, as a husband uh, as a caregiver, watching the, the person I love so much just have everything go wrong. There's a there's a lot of uh, crying out to God in prayer, but also um, just finding my strength and solace uh, in that time. And I can tell you that 
just the regular disciplines of of going to God, of making that a regular habit, and not just going when things are bad, um, but going on a normal basis. Uh, those were things that that prepared me for when she died um, to be able to walk through that time. Uh, it was almost like, you know, it was almost like in my life God had used her sickness to prepare me for. Um, the bombshell of being 27 years old and a widower. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I remember during that time, just simple prayers of, you know, and I had a little three-year-old girl with her. Um, and so it was like, I, I'm in a time where I remember one of my prayers during that time being, God, I just have a lot of decisions that I have to make, but I am just so emotionally and spiritually drained. I know I could make some very bad decisions that would affect me and my daughter right now. And so, God, I'm just going to I'm gonna walk in faith. I don't have enough strength to just sit and discern the right path in every way. So I'm going to move and walk. And, Lord, I'm just going to ask that you close any door that might be harmful uh, in my life. And, and I, looking back, see that God answered that, and he did it over and over again. Not that I made every right decision, but it was just amazing with hindsight how many doors he closed that, that would have been really foolish or harmful. Mm -hmm. um, and so just as a caregiver of, of in that depths of loneliness, uh, a lot of complaining prayers, but also um, gratitude and, and thankfulness and uh, how um, knowing that other people were praying for me uh, and their actual prayers, not just the knowledge of it, but the fact that people were praying for me lifted my soul and helped me to move on and um, just gave me great healing, able to just celebrate the life that we did have together and the fact that, that you know, Christy is, is dead on this earth, but, but she's not dead, that, that she's alive and with Jesus. And, uh, you know, knowing that that's not the last time we'll see each other was, was an incredible help. It, you know, it didn't make the day-to-day -day missing her easier, but it it made it to where grief was not the monster that could completely consume my life. And then the, the third example that I would give you is uh, a, just over five years ago, in April of 2014, my little five-year-old boy, Elijah, spiked a fever one weekend. And uh, on Monday, when we got him into the emergency room, uh, we found out that he had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so, you know, from from that morning to mid afternoon that day, just the complete floor fell out from underneath us. But I even remember um, being in the back of the ambulance because we were in a little, you know, small town hospital emergency room. And they said, the ambulance is coming to take you to the children's hospital in West Palm beach. And, and I had just let two or three people know, you know, I'd let my pastor know and I, my parents and, you know, my wife was with me. But just driving in that ambulance in the back and, and starting to get texts from this friend saying, hey, tell Elijah we're praying for him. Hey, tell Elijah we're praying for him. And I feel like that just did not stop for three and a half years. Mm. Of, um, I, 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 don't know that, I don't know that we went a day. I know that we never went a day without somebody praying for us. But I don't know that we went a day without somebody reminding us that they were praying for us. Mm. And... Um, and God used that. And I think one of the things that God does is it's, it's hard to pray for somebody and then not get emotionally and spiritually invested in how they're actually doing. And so, you know, people would ask, what can we do for you? It was, it's like, I don't know. You can't cure my son from cancer. So you know, just pray. And in praying, they came up with things to do to help our family, um, I mean, we, it was like we went through an extreme makeover homeowner edition. When we were down in the hospital, we had, we had people swarm into our house, rip up all of the carpets, lay down hardwood floors, bought a new heating air conditioning system that had one of those UV lights in it to kill bacteria. Mm. Um, I mean, they, 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 like, they, they probably put $20,000 in remodeling in our house in the first two weeks that we were in the hospital. And, and I think all of that was really launched from prayer, um, from just people 
lifting up to God, you know, Lord, help him and sustain this family. And what can we do? And then God puts things on their hearts and they, and they walk. So, you know, that's the, I think that's one of the beauties of prayer is it's not a one way street. Um, I have never had God audibly speak back to me. Um, but I, I mean, my, my life is just littered with the trail of God stepping in and speaking. And, you know, I'll sometimes lament about something in prayer and, Somebody will come along that day and, and give the answer that I was looking for. And and even if I can't, like even if even if my prayers of that day, you know, like if God doesn't answer it, um, sometimes I'm just able to let go because of being able to, to just give it to God. You know, Jesus says, cast your burdens upon me um, and cast all your cares upon me. And so being able to do that is uh, it's freeing. Like, I don't have to control the world, and I don't even have to control everything in my life. I realize that, that there's somebody who loves me even more deeply than I love myself who I get to interact with and, and to lay things at his feet. And, um, you know, Jesus told a parable uh, about God, the Father, uh, saying, you know, which of you who's a father, if his son asked him for a fish, would give him a, a snake? And... Uh, and saying, if you, being evil, know how to do good things for your kids, how much more my Heavenly Father will do good for those who love Him? And um, so I just, you know, trusting that if I don't see the answer that I'm looking for right now, it's because because in the grand scheme of things, God has something bigger and greater. And, you know, and I'll be honest, like, I've been really, really um, not happy with that answer in the moment. But... But over the course of my life, you know, given a little bit of depth and perspective, I just, I see the hand of God and what a joy to get to go to him, not just when things are bad, but also when things are good. Um, And when things are just normal, you know, like one thing about thinking you're going to lose your son to cancer is, is every day is a gift. You know, the most normal mundane day when nothing remarkable happens is an absolute treasure. Mm -hmm. And remembering to go back and thank God for those treasures um, is just something that that I think we fail to do quite often. Like, you know, when's the last time you thanked God for your opposable thumbs? (laughs) Well, you know, wait till you hurt one of them, and then all of a sudden it's a big deal. But um, we're just so littered with gifts in our lives, and, and I think... Prayer lifts our soul. And your son, Elijah, five years, right? Five years uh, this August. Actually, I think maybe the day we met, Leslie, oh. uh, was, was five years from the first cancer-free diagnosis that he had. So uh, we keep having celebrations. And um, with his, it's actually five years post-treatment before they consider the very... Uh, he's very high risk for relapse, but you know every day we go on is a is another victory day and lowers the chances of relapse. So we've got another two years of um, that cloud kind of being over us. But but it's you know what I've got four kids and I'm not guaranteed tomorrow with any of them. So Elijah's just the one that gives us perspective on all of that. Mm-hmm. There's one more thing that I think, especially coming from a, a uniquely Christian perspective, that is. Um, so empowering in prayer. In the book of Hebrews, uh, it talks about how Jesus is our great high priest. Um, And the role of the priest was to come before God. uh, You know, in the Old Testament, the role of the priest was to come before God on behalf of the people, but now we get to go directly to God. But we do so alongside Jesus. And and, and in Hebrews, it says, we have a great high priest um, who understands us because he has suffered in every way uh, like we have, yet without sin. And when I really realized what that meant, it meant that, you know, because, like, I know Jesus was God, and I know he was fully man and fully God, but I sometimes think that he didn't live the kind of drudgery life that we do sometimes. Um, but he was born into an impoverished family. Uh, he grew up, you know, as a day laborer, basically, as, as a carpenter. He, you know, in his ministry, he was homeless. Uh, he knew hunger He knew pain. Um, He knew betrayal by best friends. He knew people in his family not understanding him and laughing at him and thinking he was crazy. Uh, And so, 
you know, one of the confidences that I have in, in going to God in prayer is that I, you know, as I go in Jesus' name, you know, and Jesus represents me, he understands my suffering. Um, and, and to me, that's having a God that understands our suffering is, is pretty profound. And I think is, is one of those calls, like, why would you not pray mm. if, if that's the case? Well, thank you, Jay. I, uh, yes, ma'am. I wish you and your family uh, peace during the storm, and I'll be watching the news and, and sending my prayers to Florida. I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it. And Leslie, how, how could I pray for you? Oh, I just... I don't know. That's a that's a good question. And just recognizing me and who I am and what I do is is a solace to me. Mhm. Mm well, good. Well, can I pray for you right now? Sure. All right, Lord. I just thank you for this time with Leslie. I thank you for putting us in front of one another um, at the podcast movement and. Uh, Having listened to her podcast some and, and hearing what she's doing, I just thank you for her. I thank you how um, she has not fallen into letting this this condition that she has, letting letting those um, challenges be her story, and and she's not fallen into uh, living the rest of her life as a victim. And God, I pray that as she puts together these podcasts, as she uh, mentors people. God, I pray that you would help her to see the goodness of God in her life. I pray that, that Jesus would be very real and evident. And I pray that you would um, help bring the, the very people to this show that can be most helped. We know that there's so many people out there just on their last rope, so many people in despair. And I pray that, that they could find the show, that they could find great comfort in it, and that you could uh, help Leslie know that she's doing a really worthwhile work. And I pray that you would make it very fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for listening to Glass Half Full. Leslie invites you to leave a rating and review on iTunes. This helps spread the word to others dealing with chronic health issues. For show notes, updates, and more, visit the website glasshalffull.online. Glasshalffull.online.